<clears throat> Evening, everyone. So, yes, um, I thought I'd be mean, inspired by an article written by a, a Conservative, a former member of the Cabinet, no, no longer welcome in the current Conservative Party, uh, David Gook. I thought I would have a little look at, I had a little look at um, the Lib Dems earlier in the video today, comparing with Reform UK, more in terms of a democratic deficit, but I thought I'd have a look at um, the YouGov polling that we'd had in terms of what damage the, the Liberal Democrats need to do, because a lot of the focus, certainly a lot of my focus, as, as well as a lot of other people's in the media, is between, you know, how many seats will Labour get? How many will the Conservatives get? And, of course, in most seats, it is between the Lab Labour candidate and the Conservative candidate. So that, and obviously, in terms of who forms a government, of course, it is between Labour and the Conservatives. However, there is a slightly bigger prize on offer in this election. It's not... It, it could end up being another 1997, right? It could be another 1997 where the Conservative Party... Um, does very badly because you know it's it's chickens have come home to roost. Labour sorted itself out, and we just have nineteen ninety. But in nineteen ninety seven, you know there was there was this belief that Labour could be in government for a long time. And remember, like these days, it doesn't sound as remarkable now to think of Labour maybe be winning not just the following election; it may win the next two elections as well. And that doesn't sound a particularly remarkable thing to say. We can't take it for granted, but it doesn't sound remarkable to say it. In 1997, it did, because in 1997, Labour had never really properly won a second term. Clement Attlee sort of was able to form a government after his first term in power. I mean, Clement Attlee was technically in government during the Second World War. That is because the Conservatives formed a government of national unity. But in terms of when he won power in a general election in 1945, technically he was able to form a government after that. Um, but it didn't really, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't a strong government and it fell basically a few months later. So Labour have never really, before 1997, or I should say before 2001. But in 1997, Labour had never had that big win. But So we sort of knew as well, regardless, the Conservatives at some point would come back. Um, at the time, we may have thought we were getting proportional representation, but that didn't happen. Whereas this time, the Conservatives could be absolutely crushed, utterly crushed. But Labour cannot crush them. Labour alone cannot crush them. It would need the Liberal Democrats to win in a lot. There's two points to make. First of all, there are simply seats that Labour can't win. So what I've done on this spreadsheet is I haven't actually finished tinkering with it yet. But what I did is I put in, um, the in the purple is all the seats, according to the latest YouGov MRP poll, all the seats the Liberal Democrats should win comfortably. Um over the Conservatives, I'm mostly looking at the ones where they're in competition with the Conservatives. I may have taken out some seats where it's between Labour and, uh, sorry, the Lib Dems and someone else like the SNP or Labour. Um, this is specifically focusing on seats they take from the Conservatives. The green ones are the ones that YouGov say they'll win, um, but it could be a little closer. The dark orange ones are the ones that'll say they'll win, but only just. So, you know, the margin for error there is a who, who knows. And then the yellow ones are the ones where it's saying the Liberal Democrats will not win this. But again, it's so close, you, you, you know, you can't really tell. The blue ones are the ones where um, there's a lot of work to be done if the Lib Dems are going to challenge for it. And then the dark blue ones, it's like really tough ask. Uh, there'd need to be a major local campaign there to have a chance. And then the red ones, it's basically forget it. Now, some of these, because I've got this column down here, I've, it's, it's all very messy because um, I haven't finished it yet. But the right hand column, this is like the, this is, this is my check of are the Lib Dems even competing with the Tories here? So I've been filtering some out. So here, for example, I've got Frome and East Somerset. Um, where all it, it sort of shows that according to the MRP poll, 
Although the Lib Dems are in striking distance of the Conservatives, so a really strong campaign could do it, the waters are muddied slightly by the fact that the Labour share is greater than the Lib Dem share. And actually, if you look at those figures, you'd think Labour are going to really go for that one. But I keep it in anyway because we don't know. It may be that actually the Lib Dems have got more potential there. Um, it's just the figures at the moment have that. Um, but there we go. Uh, Phil, serious point here. Is Grinder and Tinder maybe a way for MPs to get young people engaged in politics? I strongly suspect not. It sounds to me like a great way for MPs to have their careers come crashing down. Although, of course, in the case of William Ragg, he was stepping down anyway. So he'd already announced his step. Actually, interesting. There is an interesting thing there. I'm tr I, have to, I probably should look up when he said he was stepping down. Because, for all I know, he's stepping down because <coughs> he even... So this has kept secret for a long time, wasn't it? Maybe he realised it would come out at some point and that's why he was stepping down. Maybe there was that. Um, but, the, but the other point to make is, before I start to go through some more of these, is the one that David Gork was making is... So let's say you've got um, a seat that really Labour shouldn't win, but they will. Like in 2019, there were a lot of seats the Conservatives, a few years ago, you'd have said, yeah, they're not winning that. Are you mad? Like winning a seat in Doncaster. Are you crazy? How could the Tories win in Doncaster? And yet they did. And um, it's where I grew up. Uh, not the specific part I grew up, but still. And you think to yourself, well, um, so the Conservatives won seats they really had no business winning. And you sort of thought after that election, a bit of an aberration, most of them will flip back to Labour, right? Whoever was going to be leading them. Um, but Labour are likely to do the same thing this time. And it's the same logic. You'll think it'll basically be for this thing, for the circumstances in this election, a lot of Conservative voters are going to say, we can't support this Conservative government and then or leadership and, and they'll stay at home. And a lot of people, for other reasons, will vote for Labour and Labour will win those seats. A lot of them will just flip straight back because they're seats that are real, they're Conservative, really. And it's just that what will cause Labour to win those seats is the fact that a lot of the Conservative voters who don't like Labour will, they don't want to get their fingerprints on another Conservative government. You know, some people are, it's like, look, I, I, I don't want to have any part of this election because they cannot support the party that they really want to support. And there isn't another one they're really wanting to support. So what will happen is a few years in opposition, the Conservatives will detoxify a little bit and those voters will turn out again because all of a sudden they can no longer blame them for whatever the ills in the world that they perceive to be. And they'll flip back. But what David Gork makes the point of, but for the seats that go to the Liberal Democrats, that is not guaranteed. Because there's a lot of these moderate Conservative voters. They're not ideologically opposed to the Lib Dems. How can you be? How can you be ideologically opposed to the Lib Dems? The Lib Dems don't really have much of an ideology, right? Uh, that is the whole point of them. They're sort of betwixt and between. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult, unless you're really, really tribal, it's really difficult to have an ideological opposition to the Lib Dems. You can have, you know, you can have some disdain for the particular leadership or certain policies, of course you can. But in terms of like what they are or stand for, it's really hard. Um, so some of those moderate voters, if they can elect a, a Liberal Democrat candidate, all of a sudden that doesn't necessarily automatically flip back. Even if it's a seat that's voted Conservative for like 200 years, if they get a Lib Dem in, all of a sudden, oh, well, we don't mind the Lib Dems. So not only are there a lot of seats that only the Lib Dems can take off the Conservatives, but the ones they do take, which helps to like beat them down to a very, very low number of seats. The 
the benefit is, the extra benefit is, when those conservative voters who are basically going to stay at home, I mean, let's be clear, the reason why the conservatives are going to lose really badly in this coming election, it's not because Labour are going to get a load more extra votes. It's not because Reform UK are going to take a load of extra votes. They're, they're probably going to take quite a few. It will ultimately be because a lot of conservative voters just don't vote at all. That will be what it's about. It's because they don't vote at all. The Conservatives, um, they've lost votes to Labour, they've lost votes to Reform UK, they've lost votes to the Lib Dems, but they've lost votes to the SOFA. And those votes will probably come back, but where will they come back? They won't go to Labour. Because if they weren't going to vote for Labour in this election, why would they, a few years down the line, if they're not prepared to use their vote to vote for Labour with the country and the state it's in, they're not going to vote for Labour in a few years' time, or very few will. Some, you could argue, may go, oh, their policy's actually really good. Yeah, we'll vote for them. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen on a large scale. So they'll come back, they'll want to vote, and they'll want to vote Conservative. So it's about them going, oh, but actually the Lib Dem, that our Lib Dem MP's done all right, and yeah, we don't mind the Lib Dems. So maybe they kept keep down from that point of view. I'll catch up with some comments before I ramble on further. Um... Could those types of disenfranchised Tory voters you just mentioned switch to Reform UK? So for this coming election, I mean, let's let's really be clear. Reform UK are trying to present a particular image. But in reality, if you look at their policies, who do they try to appeal to? Ultimately, xenophobes. That's really their thing. Um, you know, it's quite distressing to think they could get three to four million votes because it just shows just, you know, but it's still, it's a relative minority. Now, I will just point out, there are people that, you know, when I say, let's say Reform UK get 4 million votes, it doesn't mean, oh, there's 4 million xenophobes in the country. There's likely to be many more than that. There will be some people, like the Conservatives at the moment are saying, oh, a vote for Reform UK is a vote for a Starmer government, right? Because they're talking about vote splitting, or what do you do about vote splitting? You have proportional representation. Oh, but they don't want that. So there are voters who may think that Reform UK's ideas are better than the Conservatives, but they'll vote pragmatically for the Conservatives because they know that ultimately Reform UK cannot stop Labour. You know, so there's the you know Reform UK may well get three to four million votes. The Conservatives may get millions of their own votes that would prefer to vote Reform UK but won't because they know Reform UK is a busted flush in terms of like, you know, achieving anything in Parliament. Um, uh, but there we go. Um, so, let's catch another question. Um, Will say, I have almost sympathy for victims of sexually driven blackmail like he experienced is human deserves to have the freedom to explore consensual adult relationship, even if he's an MP. Yes, but the, the issue is, see, ironically, I have more sympathy for him for the thing he did majorly wrong, which was to give away personal details of MPs. He shouldn't have done that. But you can understand in the panic, doing something unwise. We've all done something unwise when we've panicked. But he's an MP. I'm sorry, like I've been a teacher... There are certain things as a teacher that I knew, in fact, I was told, that I knew were unwise. For example, sounds silly, when I was young, I just left university, I started teaching, I did not go out to a club in my own town. The, the risk of like trying to pull one of my own students was like, no, 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 no. So I didn't go to any clubs anywhere, anywhere in striking distance of my town as a young teacher. You know, there, is, there are other things as well. You know, there are other things you accept as a teacher that you don't, you know, you, um, that, you know, some the certain freedoms that, or, you know, a clerk or something like that or someone can, can have in public that a teacher can't. You know, the same applies to other professions as well, of course. So an, an MP, it's, it's, you know, you cannot just think as an MP, oh, I can live my life 
as I used to do. And it'd be fine. No, you have to accept some responsibilities. And in the case of an MP, do you know what? You get paid a bloody sight more than a teacher. You are more than fairly recompensed for the fact you're going to have to have a few privations in your life. And one of them is not taking photos of you. I mean, to be honest, no one should take a photo of their genitals and send it to someone they don't know. Under any circumstances, it's not part of a normal dating scene. It might, some people may think it is. It's not. It's not. Right. And I know Grindr's not, not or Tinder, come to that, is not part of a normal dating scene either. But still, you know, but as an MP, whatever you might have done as a, as a, normal private citizen as an mp you have to be aware that there are people who if they come across something will use it against you just like as a teacher but also unlike a teacher as an mp you are going to be targeted by people you are going to be subject to scams and stings and and really i mean the authorities are partly to blame blame because all new mps should have that drilled into them you are going to be a target. You know, act with a bit of decorum. But anyway, uh, where's the talk about AI thumbnails I promised recently? It's because it kept running out of time. Uh, I can all, I can do a bit at the end of this uh, the stream if you like. Um, uh, but yeah, I do need to do that. Uh, we've all done something unwise when we've panicked. Might as well be the motto of this brand of Conservative Party. Yeah, but um, you know, the, the thing he did wrong was providing a photo that if it had gone to someone without his best interests at heart could have caused him a lot of trouble, as indeed it did. And he didn't know the person he was sending it to. He was incredibly naive. And, you know, an MP should not be that naive. You know, remember, an MP, unlike most workers, you, like for most workers, you can say, well, they need a job. Like no MP needs that job. They've had a job. They had a job already. They gave it up to become an MP. So they chose to become an MP. It wasn't part of their, you know, their career. It is for some, but they choose it, right? They can have a different career. They'll choose it. So I don't have a great deal of sympathy for an MP that gets into a situation that if it happens to an or a private citizen, you may have more sympathy for. Because they they need to accept a higher level of responsibility for the way they live their life. Uh, Rag, uh, Rags apologised. What has he done to repair the damage he's done? Well, the thing is, he creates a damage. And, and when he saw the damage, he tried to cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. Notice that he's only actually apologised and his apology may be genuine. I'm not, I'm not, but nonetheless, he's only apologised when he got, when it became public. That's, that's the problem, isn't it? Uh, John said, I remember young local teachers chatting up students in pub. Totally wrong. Would not happen now, but was in the 80s. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's not supposed to happen at all. I mean, interestingly, when I first became a teacher, the head of Ofsted at the time, uh, is it Chris Woodhead? Something like that. He actually advocated teachers having relationships with their A-level students. It was completely potty. The teaching profession, needless to say, was not in accordance with this view. Nor, indeed, was the, at that time, new Labour government. Um, but there wasn't a lot they could do about it till they could ease him out. Uh, have Labour said they'll do away with using private contractors like capital for use in the waste of public money. Um, so they've talked about, I know they've talked about in the NHS, massively increased insourcing. I don't think, it's actually quite interesting because I'll be doing something with uh, a video for um, We Own It next week, hopefully, all things going well, about a little campaign they've got. Um, and part of their campaign is about, you know, using private contractors. It is a waste of money. Uh, for, so, there are certain things, I mean, I'm not an expert on defence procurement, right? So I can't say... But for certain things, um, you know, a, a private, if, if you can provide the service yourself in house and you have regular need of it, then there is no argument for a private contractor. I mean, the, ex, the example I always give, because it's so easy to understand, is private cleaning contractors in, the, in hospitals. It's like, no, because like 
two reasons. First of all, they don't actually clean. Hospitals are filthy now. You know, the last time I stayed in a hospital after some surgery, I actually observed the cleaners and they just came in and they came in with one of those machines that strokes the floor and they did that. I was in there for three days. I never once saw a cleaner clean. I saw them come in for a few minutes with the thing that strokes the floor, not even under the beds and bugger off again. And you know, you can tell in a hospital, I, I remember, cause my mum was a nurse. So when I was young, sometimes the childcare was me being left in the children's bit playing with the toys, right? Uh, with other nurses looking over me while my mum did her, her shift. And um, they, were spe they were sparkling, those wards. They were very clean. You noticed they were clean. They sm it was like the smell of disinfectant ever, you know. Now they don't, they're actually filthy. They're dirt it's like they were really noticeably clean when I was young, and now they're dirtier than a, an average home. Um, so there's a, and of course they're, and, and this isn't like a service you need now and then. Like if you're getting a new IT system, okay, you don't have a department for IT systems. You use a private contractor there, right? Hopefully a better one we generally use. Um, but if it's a cleaning service, you need cleaning every day. So why, why wouldn't the hospital employ their own cleaners? Like what's the advantage? There's none at all. But in terms of going back to Labour's specific policies on it, they'll never promise to get rid of all um, like private contracts because you can't. Like There isn't the capacity. Even if they all sort of thought, yeah, these are all a waste of money. You know, if, if my criteria are, if the service is needed regularly, we're not talking about something that's needed once every so often, like a plumber or something, or a maintenance engineer. You're talking about someone where they're going to have work, every, you're going to have work for them every single day. Yeah, employ your own, employ your own. Um, but there isn't the capacity to do that quickly. What I am hoping for is that Labour are determined to, over time, bring more of it in-house. Now, they've said that of the NHS. I don't know that they've said it of a lot of other government departments, though. Uh, why don't Labour commit to publicly owned water after Thames water fiasco? So, it's... Um, so Louise Haig made the point, and, and to be honest, independent um, lawyers have made the point as well. It sounds like, and I think we still should on balance, like I don't think we should give public money to Thames Water. It sounds like an obvious thing, doesn't it? Allow Thames Water to just fail and then take it over cheaply. Um, but apparently there's a hell of a lot of legislation and regulations that would have to be unpicked to do it. Um, now, what I would say as a, a, you know, a halfway house, because here's the situation, right? The situation is this simple. Thames Water needs to, well, all the water companies, but Thames Water is the first one in major trouble. They need to invest big time. Now, they haven't got the money to invest because they've actually been pissing it away over the years. So they haven't got the money. And it doesn't matter what you say to them. You wag your finger as much as you like at them. They haven't got the money. So where do they get the money to do that? And they can't actually provide the service now without that investment. They've, they've just bled the whole thing dry. There are three ways to do it. The first is you... Um, you give a load of public money to them to do it for you. Uh, we should not be doing that at all. The second option is that you let it fail, take it over, have to spend a lot of time in Parliament, apparently uh, changing legislation, and then you spend the public money yourself doing that. That's a non-starter as well because... That goes back to the old problem of if you nationalise by spending a load of money on it and putting up debt, then the Tories go, oh, look, tax and spend, and you lose the next election. So the what's end, what's going to end up happening is, is in order for Thames Water to get the money they need basically from banks or investors, however you want to look at it, um, they're going to need to put bills up. Now, for my money, I would, I don't think Labour, during a cost of living crisis, as its first acting government, 
should be saying, yeah, these bills are going to have to go up because that's the only way to fund it. I think the bills are going to have to go up, but I think at the very least, the government should be, they should be doing something to make sure that the industry is paying for this ultimately. Um, now, Labour do have specific policies on dividends. They're going to make dividends dependent on certain performance targets. But in terms of why Labour don't just say, right, we need to bring this into public control now, I, they say, and, uh, you know, and a few experts are backing them up a little bit, as well as some saying, yeah, it's not a good enough job, um, that it's just too much legislation. Uh, Gary's going back to the old teachers there. My physics teacher in the 80s married one of his students. Yeah, the president of France married his teacher as well. Um, but it's not, you know, I mean, if it happens after they've left school, who, whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, but you're not supposed to have these relationships whilst they're at school or college. And, and these days, teachers are, in fact, all of my career, teachers have been way more professional about these things. Um, indeed, actually, the last Labour government strengthen the legislation on it. It wasn't just professional standards that rose. You know, the legislation, it was suddenly taken much more seriously. I mean, before then it was like, yeah, just don't have sex with them if they're under 16. Whereas then it became, yeah, don't have any relationship with them if they're under 19. Um, so I've known a few teachers get into real trouble, um, you know, quite rightly. But anyway. I think it's the third time I hear the hospital cleaning story. It's good to underscore the point. It's, it's just, it's the most obvious one. Like if you come up with any other example of something, people go, oh, but efficiencies, efficiencies. But cleaning, because we all do it, like if you talk about delivering, say, cancer treatment services, which have been privatized in the last few years, including for children. So we've privatized those now. You know, people, because they don't know how they deliver them, they think, oh, but you know, it's more efficient because the Tories say that it's more efficient. Whereas if you say cleaning, people understand what cleaning is and you can show someone in a hospital, does this look clean? No, it does not. You can, you know, if they're in hospital, you can say, have you observed the cleaners? Do they give it a really good clean? No, they do not. And then you can say to them, and cleaning's needed every day, isn't it? So why wouldn't the hospital employ their own cleaners? How is it that a private company is able to get better cleaners, because they're clearly not better cleaners, get better cleaners, do a better job and make a profit on top and all for less money. Because that's what the Tories tell us, that they can do they can do the job better um, and they can do it more cheaply and they can make a profit on top. That's how good they are. And people sort of buy it. But when it comes to cleaning services, it makes no sense. Oh, it makes no sense at all. So you can explain that to people really easily because people understand what's involved in cleaning because everyone does it not everyone does it there are some scruffy bastards but you know generally speaking people do that right i'm now getting a load of stories in the chat about various teachers having relationships with people they shouldn't have done should we just say it's 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 long been considered unacceptable uh doesn't thames water owe a ton of money to a couple of chinese banks yeah the um Yes, basically, we've now got a situation where this is actually an interesting one from the Conservatives' point of view. So effectively now, but because the Conservatives are leaving this for Labour, so that's why it's, it's absolutely right to wonder exactly what Labour are going to do to resolve this, because they are going to be the ones who resolve it. The Tories seem to be, like everything else, they're just leaving it now. Oh, school collapses? Yeah, just leave that for Labour. Hospital collapses? Leave that for Labour. Um, maybe take the ceiling off that doctor's leg that got broken, but, you know, ultimately leave it all for Labour to sort out. And I think they're doing the same here. Leave it for Labour. Um, but it is an interesting one for the Conservatives because they are, by doing nothing, effectively what they're doing is allowing the Chinese state to have an influence in our public utilities. Now, given that at the moment the... Conservative government seems to be very anti-China. Um, that's an interesting position to be in. Um, hang on. 
Uh, what's my view on cannabis legislation? Why don't Labour back it as Germany have now legalised it as well as Canada? Lots of US states, so why don't Labour do this? Uh, same reason any government won't do it or will do it eventually, public opinion. Uh, my own view on it is that any freedom must come with responsibility. I don't think it's as simple as just legalising it. Um, Decriminalising, certainly, there's absolutely no point in criminalising people for it. Um, it just creates more problems than it solves. In terms of legalising in general, you've got to have public opinion on your side. And, the, you know, and people will point to some, oh, but this and that. Yeah, if not, otherwise Labour would. Labour have got no ideological op opposition to it. Um, it's really a case of public opinion, which, you know, will change over time. And also it will change if we do introduce electoral reform. All of a sudden, um, the people who matter change as well as more people get more um, electoral power. But ultimately, it's really that simple. It's down to public opinion. You know, politicians that are focused on um, winning an election do not create antagonistic policies with the electorate. Hang on a minute, what's this? Someone just said, the cleaners don't do a great job of cleaning our student flat, think they're employed by the university. Why have you got cleaners clean? Why don't you clean it yourself? You've got cleaners who clean. Why don't you clean it yourself? Lazy students. We had to clean ours ourselves. Um, uh, yeah, it's efficient to fill in reality. It's replacing good wages, minimum wages, and good, well, at least there is a minimum wage these days. Good quality workers with those who aren't employed for enough hours to do a decent job, quality and pay down, profits up. Um, I mean, well, ultimately, they will be told to do too much for the hours. You know, you'll have had at one time a couple of cleaners that would have spent a certain amount of time cleaning a room, like a small ward or something, right? Now, it's like one who's given like the whole floor and they've got like the same amount of time to do it. So of course they just go around with the machine. Um, it's, and, and given the need for cleanliness in hospitals, it's absolutely obscene. It's not just that it's a waste of money. It, it's, uh, it, it absolutely pisses me off because it is the stupid form, the stupidest form of privatization. Hiring people to do uh, a job that doesn't require a lot of I get into trouble if I call it about unskilled labor but when we say unskilled labor we don't mean there's no skill to it what we mean is it's easy to teach most people those skills um, but when you've got this sort of unskilled labor the hospital can the, the hospital can get cleaners the fact that they are told to get private a private cleaning contractor is is mind-blowing to me i don't even understand how a conservative looks at that and goes yeah i mean even they must go yeah we believe in the privatization model but you've got to be pragmatic haven't you you've got to like judge it when you say labor's been seen as having magic buttons a bit like my department i mean the, there will be some things they can do i i think maybe labor are being overly cautious on some things you know, when, I mean, it comes to the Thames water, sure, there may be a lot of legislation they have to put in place if they were going to like formally nationalise it, but they don't have to formally nationalise it. What they can do is what the Conservatives have done with particularly rail companies when they've gone into trouble is they can just take it into public hands to oversee it. It can still, it's like it's technically privatised still. So if, if a Labour government takes over Thames Water they say well you keep the debts we're not taking that on right you piss off we'll we'll manage the services it can it's still technically privatized it's just that a bit like with Royal Bank of Scotland the UK government has the controlling interest in it and it can be with the assumption that in a few years time once it's all sorted um, that it returns back to to the private sector it's just that what Labour could then do is once they've cleared the decks and they've got more time, they can then start changing the legislation to bring it back into 
public control anyway. So I really don't, uh, it's called a buffering machine. It's a, it strokes the carpet. It may well be called a buffering machine, but all it did was, was a carpet, I say carpet, it didn't have carpet, lino. It strokes a machine to stroke the floor. I mean, the, the floor needed cleaning before it needed buffering. Uh, agency clean will have more than half the fee taken by agency and VAT. Um, I mean, it, it's utterly irrelevant what the, 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 the cleaner is paid from the hospital's point of view. What matters is how much is the service costing them and how much would it cost them to use the same money to employ cleaners and like a cleaning foreman type thing um, to manage them. Uh, out of 10, what are the chances the Lib Dems becoming the official opposition? I'm guessing a three. It, something like that, yeah. I, I do think the... I have not really referred to this too much now. Uh, I do think there is a decent chance. There are a lot of ifs, though. So if we go through all the ifs. First of all, the Conservatives have to carry on basically being utterly useless. That's probably a given, but, you know. Second... Nothing must happen that somehow gets people to look at things differently. Um, so, in other words, no Google is being bowled or curveballs if you're American or anything like that coming our way. You know, just the 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 next eight months happens as we'd sort of expect it to happen. Um, the third thing where we start to get into big ifs is so at the moment. I, like I say, the thing that really crushes the Conservatives, it's not Reform UK taking a load of their votes, although I'll come to that. It's not the Lib Dems or Labour or anything like that. It's, it's Conservatives staying at home. You know, the votes, the votes they're losing to other parties, that's what causes them to lose, but it's not what causes them to be crushed. What causes them to be crushed is their own support staying at home. Now... This is why, and although Labour gets stick for it, this is why Labour, in the interests of crushing the Tories, have to keep doing it. What Labour are trying to do at the moment is not give those Conservative voters an excuse to go out and, and you know, when they're thinking, we don't want to vote for this Conservative government, what they don't want to do is get them to think, but it'll be better than Labour. So they go out, hold their nose, vote Conservative. What Labour are trying to do is be as inoffensive as possible to those voters. As inoffensive as possible. So that even if they won't vote Labour or Lib Dem or anyone else, they will at least not vote Conservative. That is really important. What we need is for the Conservative vote to really collapse. Because if you look at it at the moment, you know, you're looking at... Um, what's the Conservative vote share in this latest poll from it's higher than the weekly polls it's 20 24 24 percent so that's suggesting about 24 percent of of voters will vote conservative it was about 43 percent at the last election so you're talking millions of voters fewer for the conservatives absolutely millions and yeah so labor needs to be as inoffensive as possible that means not weighing in on issues that will like um, spook the horses. Then another big if is Reform UK. Are they going to stand their candidates in all the seats they claim they are? Um, a huge unknown. I mean, I can say that I believe Richard Tice means it. I can't be certain. Who knows? It could be that the... Cons I mean, it, I'm also of the view... I'm also of the view that Reform UK exist just to get what they want from the Conservatives. Now, the reason why I believe that they will try and stand candidates in this election is because even if they get the Conservatives to adopt the manifesto that they want, the Conservatives are still going to lose. So actually, it's in Reform UK's interest... It was different last time. Last time they could actually be the difference between the Conservatives winning and not. So they they could say to the Conservatives, we helped you. Um, now, 
they can't do that this time because if they stand down, okay, they will be helping the Tories technically, but it won't be to help them win power. And then if they've stood down candidates two elections in a row, people won't really trust them in the next one. So they're actually better off standing, claiming that they cost the Tories, like if let's say they cost the Tories about 50 seats, claiming they cost them 100 or something, right? Just embellish it, like they always do. Um, and then um, and then in the next election, say, if you want us to stand down, you need to adopt what they call conservative values, what we would call fascist values. But there is another there is a problem for Reform UK. I have said for the longest time that I am not sure that they are, I don't think they've got the infrastructure to have candidates for all like 632 seats in Britain. Like it's it's a huge undertaking. Other political like even the Lib Dems and the Greens don't put a candidate in every seat in Britain because they're, they're not large enough as a party to do that. It's only Labour and the Conservatives that really do. And so the Reform UK, they just don't have that infrastructure. So how are they going to do it? And I said, if they try, what's going to happen is they'll end up with a load of loonies and someone will point out that they've been really obnoxious a few years ago or at some point in their past. And then it'll all come back to them. And that's what's happening. You know, um, Hope Not Hate have been highlighting the the past statements of a load of reform uk candidates and reform uk have been binning them right but they've still been making them their candidates so then they've got to find another candidate well they're going to end up finding another candidate who's just as bad because they can't actually vet them all and also they attract a large number of these swivel-eyed loons anyway so it's not like it's not just that their vetting process is clearly crap because if someone can find a tweet and they didn't pick that up in themselves in their vetting, it's not a very good vetting process. And then imagine what happens. It's all right, Reform UK chucking those candidates now and getting another one. What happens after the deadline passed? The, the election's called, deadline for candidates. That passes. And then let's say a load of people discover things about a load of these Reform UK candidates. What do they do then? It's too late to get a new one. It's too late to pull the old one. What do they do? They just conf they end up confusing the whole issue. So it may well be that Reform UK may well intend to put a candidate up in every seat, but they may not be able to. So we will see. That is a big if as well. And then the other big if is can we persuade people to vote tactically on the, le on the scale needed to achieve this crushing of the Tories? Because there will be people, quite reasonably, who go, look, the polling says it's a foregone conclusion and they only think in binary terms who forms the government and they'll think, you know, um, and they don't realise that there's a prize on offer here and that prize is hardly any Tory MPs. And you'll get people thinking, but I don't want Labour to have too many MPs. Like, They're already going to have too many. I don't want them to have too many. And you think about it this way. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not... In Scotland, Labour are in competition with the SNP mostly. OK, it's a different thing there. But in England, in particular England, which is where most of the seats are anyway, there's the odd competition between Lib Dems and Labour. Not really many. Uh, there's only one major one. Uh, there's a couple between the Greens and Labour. That's it. The vast majority of them are between the Labour and the, and the Conservatives. So by saying you want Labour to win fewer seats, you're saying you want the Tories to win more seats. And also think about it. Think about what a lot of people's objections to Labour is. It tends to be policies that are um, skirting very close to what would be appealing to Conservative voters, yeah? Why is that? Why do Labour have those policies? Because they're trying to win over those Conservative voters. They're countering Conservative policies. Now, if the Conservatives didn't exist as a political force, Labour wouldn't have to counter the Conservatives. You know, if the Liberal Democrats and the SNP form the bulk of the opposition, even if it's a much smaller opposition than now, Labour will need to counter them, not the Conservatives. So the prize of crushing the Conservatives is that the Conservatives do not feature in Labour's policymaking anymore. The media still will. 
but then that's why we need electoral reform and media reform as well. Uh, is North East Somerset and, and Hanam on my Lib Dem spreadsheet? Okay, let's have a look. Oh, where's it gone? Oh, it's there. I hadn't named it. Um, right, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, I do need to finish this off. Um, North East Somerset is, yeah, I mean, that's in red, so I'm not giving the, um, what's this looking like? So this is between Conservatives and Labour. The Lib Dems are nowhere. And um, what's the other one you said? I've lost it. Hannam. Uh, that doesn't appear to be there. I could always look. I mean, I can look these ones up on the full list. What's going on at Hannam? Hang on. Oh. Oh. Uh, is this like a current name for it that's changing or something? Do you mean North East Somerset and Hannam as if it's the same constituency? Uh, in which case, remember, these are the new constituency names that are on here. Um, some of them have changed. Oh, no, no, it is. Sorry, North East Somerset and Hannam. So, yeah, OK. Um, if I just get rid of these because these are the old ones. Um yeah, it's between Labour and the Conservatives. Lib Dems are nowhere on that. I point out to say, when Cameron today had an interesting conversation with the proper Tory, pointed out what they've done in the country is what they've done to minorities for years, got an apology. It is, do you know, it is interesting. Anecdotally, there are a lot of people that are saying to me when they are going out canvassing that there's a lot of lifelong conservative voters. When we talk about live, I mean, we're not talking about people who are like 25 right and voted from once. We mean people, you know, well into middle age or older who that means they voted conservative during the Labour years. Um, and they, you know, the, the number of them that are not just saying they're not going to vote Tory at all, that would be huge. If you've got people who voted conservative even through, the, even in 1997, when a great deal of the country did not, um, it, or even 2001, because like 1997, okay, the Tories would fail, let's try someone else. In 2000, like that first term of Labour's was an absolute blinder. It was stunning. It's, it's a shame that they didn't keep up with that sort of energy. Um, but, and, and it's also a shame they didn't sort of ignore foreign policy quite a lot. There was a couple of good foreign policy options. Um, but 2000, yeah, if they didn't vote in 1997 or 2001, and yet they they won't vote Tory now. That's huge. But it, but some of them are saying they will never vote Conservative again. I mean, this one hasn't necessarily said that. But, you know, the number of people that say they voted Conservative for decades, they voted for Thatcher, for Major, they, they voted for William Hague even in opposition and Michael Howard and so on. Um, they voted for Boris Johnson last time round. But they won't vote... And it's not just that they won't vote for Rishi Sunak. By saying they'll never vote, and they might. I mean, people change their minds. But by saying that, what it means is they don't care who leads the Conservatives. It's like these people are saying, we recognise that it's the Conservative Party that are fundamentally broken. Uh, just how, this is important in question, uh, Angie Pagan, just how much more funding will the Labour government likely have after just running the country properly for a year? The stopping of Tory waste must be a fair bit by itself. I would think so. Uh, it is, unfortunately, far too comfortable to think in those terms. I would have thought so. I suppose the problem is that what the Conservatives are doing right now is um, granting a lot of long-term contracts to, like, emphasis mostly. So Labour can't just cancel those contracts because they're contracts. Um, they could be, I mean, I've argued they could be a bit sniffy about the terms of them. But a lot of these, con you know, the, I think the Conservatives are going to be issuing a lot of contracts this year, long-term contracts. In terms of getting more money, because they do need more money, the bottom line is all, for all Labour saying, you can't just um, borrow your way to growth or you can't just 
you know, throw money at these problems. And yeah, that alone doesn't do it, absolutely. But you do need the money. Because there's another saying, you need to you need to speculate to accumulate. So investment is absolutely needed. Legislation can do some things. Um, you are going to need to invest. Where's the money coming from? Um, from those who are close to Rachel Reeves, her focus is closing tax loopholes. Because the issue for Labour is... Um, they're not going to put up taxes because even if they even if you talk about things like a wealth tax, the problem is that then people think it applies to them when they're not wealthy. It's like, no, mate, you're not wealthy. They don't. I, it's the, I, I keep saying it's the problem with inheritance tax. About four percent of the population will pay inheritance tax. But if but polling says that about a third of people think they will. So there's this problem with perception. So Labour can't go anywhere near tax rises. To, to begin with anyway um they can't just borrow loads of, they, they can borrow for investment like everyone understands that the market understands that the market isn't going to throw a wobbly because you borrow for investment they threw a wobbly with trust because she was borrowing for tax cuts that's not investment but politically that's tricky as well again they, they are going to but they're going to like that's going to be much slower but where you do have huge scope is is tax breaks tax loopholes that exist that don't need to exist because by closing some of those off you create extra tax revenues without putting you're not putting taxes up the tax rate staying exactly the same but you are getting more money because there's a load of people who should be paying tax and aren't doing and you can do that quite quite quiet quietly uh, do i have time to talk about the ai yeah let's do that to begin with so or to end with sorry to end with so on the channel, um, I will do a quick video on this as well at some point. But what I've, you'll notice what I've done in the thumbnail, I did do it in a couple of the videos early on just to, uh, to try it out. Uh, but in the thumbnails, I've been putting some AI art. Some people have got a problem with it. Now, there's, there's, I'll, I'll go through the major concerns that people have had. So one is that it's just naff. Okay, well, that's, you know, that is a more serious issue, ironically, but it's also subjective. Um, secondly, some people have got moral objections. However, I've not heard any that make sense. So if I go through what the moral objections some people have had are, and I have tried to answer some people in the, in the chat, but not everyone. The first one, some people saying, oh, but AI um, uses other artists' work to learn from, and it's not got their permission. It's like, yeah, that's how human artists learn. Human artists learn by doing that. Human, I've known art. I've known some good artists. Some good friends of mine are artists. Um, you you look at tens of thousands of pieces of other people's art, and you start to copy it, and then you learn the techniques, and then you develop your own technique, and you develop your own style, and then you produce original pieces of art which you then can sell, or you know whatever, and then it's yours. It's called your original artwork. But to learn those skills, you copied and looked at. A lot of other artists you didn't get their permission so you know it's not that ai is using other people's artwork it learns from it but so does everyone so that's not a reason the second one is oh but it's like um you know it's costing artists their jobs it's like no it's not where there are issues like some people will have cited Oh, the, you know, there's this aggro with studios because studios are now using AI instead of artists. It's like, yeah, that's an issue. So you can have that issue. That's not me. The art I have on my thumbnail was never going to come from an artist. It's physically impossible for an artist to do artwork for my thumbnails. And it's economically impossible. It's physically impossible because I need to generate that thumbnail usually about an hour before it goes live. Uh, so an artist couldn't possibly do it in that time. And it's also economically impossible because whatever they would need to charge me doesn't make it would cost more than the video. So there is artwork I do get for the channel, and there will be some Mara artwork coming this. But the only artwork I can get from an artist, a human artist, is one that I use a lot. It needs to because I pay for it, so it needs to have a lot of recyclability. Um, so the the artwork, and I'll tell you what I find odd about the argument about. Oh, but, you know, then you're taking work from artists. Like, no, I'm not, because artists aren't doing my thumbnails. But who is, like, on the thumbnail for this 
today because I've not used AI for this one. This because this is this live one. Um, I used a photo. In fact, I used two photos. Now people took those photos. I don't have their permission. I'm using it's fair use. It's legal, but I don't have their permission. And I don't get how people have an issue with me using AI, which no artist generated and for which I've paid. So therefore, that's giving some people their wages, as opposed to me just going on Google Images and getting some images where I've got no one's permission and I haven't paid anyone for it at all. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I don't get that. Um, the other thing I would just say is going back to. There are some like large organizations, maybe studios who could use artists and would have used artists in the past and now are using AI generation. And you can definitely have an argument with that because absolutely that is taking jobs away. So first of all, that's not me. And second of all, the AI art generator I'm using, no one who could otherwise afford to pay an artist is using it, it's too crap. I mean, I've deliberately gone with one that's a bit naff. I've deliberately gone with something that's a bit crap. Um, it can produce some cool stuff, but the thumbnails that I'm going for are very cartoonish. And if you look at them closely, they're not. The, the idea of them, you ask yourself, why have I changed from it? It's because the, um, um, the, the thumbnail is incredibly important on YouTube. And my thumbnails, I've, I there's, there's, every now and then I need to work on like improvements to the channel. Because you may think, well, it's doing all right, it's doing all right. It's like, yes, but I don't want to get to the point where it's not because then it's too late to build it back up. I've seen too many YouTubers coast and then they fail. And there are things on the horizon which will have a bit of a, an issue anyway. The thumbnail is so important and it needs to leap out at you. And my thumbnails, as they have been, are a weakness. They've changed several times, but they're still a weakness. Now, this doesn't necessarily solve the whole problem, but it may help. And I can't know that until I've got a lot of data. Have I considered just doing the art myself? I'm not an artist. How hard could it be? Uh, uh, I'm not an artist. I really am not. Um, uh, disagree with my arguments, but can't be bothered to dis debate it. You can absolutely debate it. We've got a few minutes. Um, But, you know, it's it's not taking any money from anyone. It doesn't generate it. It's like I haven't switched from using an artist to using this. The work I get artists to do, they're still doing and they will still do. Um, and the stuff that is like that I do myself, I have the photos I'm using, someone has actually taken those photos and I'm not stealing them, as I say. Um, and if they've gone to length to say, no, this is copyrighted, I don't want to use it. I don't use it, right? The ones that put the watermarks or stuff like that on. I don't use those. I just use the ones that have already been widely shared. They've come across in Google Images. It is legal, but I don't have anyone's permission. Um, you know, and as I say, it's I'm not even using an art generator an AI art generator that would be used by people who would otherwise use an artist's impression because the one I use isn't capable. I mean, it's an absolute nightmare. I mean, the stuff that I actually use in the thumbnails is usually like the 10th iteration or something. It's an absolute pain in the ass. The, but even, you know, given that it takes some time, it still doesn't produce stuff that would be as good as an actual artist. So if you're a company that wants decent artwork, you don't use this. Uh, maybe Rish has been using AI for his campaign leaflets. I think he's been using Microsoft Paint, quite frankly. Uh, some AI images seem cartoonish for a serious political channel. Nothing wrong with cartoon. I've deliberately made them cartoonish so that they can't pot. I mean, they wouldn't look that real anyway. I did on a couple of them have it realish, but I'm really conscious of the need for it to be obviously fake. But the whole point of a thumbnail is to attract attention. So the image has to attract attention. Then the title hopefully gets the person to go, oh, it's about this. A photo of Rishi Sunak, which is what almost all of them tend to be, or even Keir Starmer, anyone like that, doesn't really grab attention too much. What tool do I use? It's called GenCraft, I think. Hold on. Oh. 
Yeah, GenCraft. Uh, do I want some light art I've taken as a photographer? No, no, thanks. Uh, I, I, I need new stuff. Every thumbnail really ideally needs to be distinctive. It needs its own thing. Um, it may not work. I mean, I'm not sold on it. It's just what I can't do is coast because that way, like first of all, the whole point of the channel is to, is to get out a message. So you want it to get out to as many people as possible. So from that point of view, there's no such thing as getting it out to enough people. I mean, one thing I did last autumn, for example, was start the shorts. Now, if I quick check on that, about 10% of all my viewers are watch, not just watching shorts, but only watching shorts. So I've basically increased, hugely increased the number of people who watch my content because they're watching shorts. In fact, at the moment, 14% of all my viewers in the last 28 days have only watched shorts. I don't make anything from them. But it's all about trying to get them. And, and, and you know, I don't think I can get a brilliant message out in a minute, uh, between 40 seconds and a minute. But, you know, it is, it is better than nothing. And what it means is when I then need to get a message out about, for example, registering for the election or making sure you've got the right voter ID, I've now got a number of people who, who watch those shorts who will have a decent chance of seeing that message. But also it is the case that you can't just think, particularly with something like politics, it'd be slightly different if it was a cooking channel. Because with a cooking channel, you know, as long as you maintain a certain level of output, um, it should be fine because that there's no real turbulence with a cooking channel. Whereas with a, a political channel, of course there is. There could be huge turbulence when there's a change of government. So you have to make sure constantly that you are looking to improve things. Um, I've noticed I've tried adding video clips in my videos some time ago. No, I've never tried that. I have put video clips in my videos before. It's never a thing I've tried should I do more of. I know like Max Robespierre does it a lot. I don't. I prefer to put a link in the description below. I don't like to have the video broken up if I can describe it. It's just that sometimes the clip is short enough and um, you can't really get across like the power of it by describing it, so I'll put it in. So it's not something I've tried and then gone, oh no. It's something I will still do where I think it adds. I just, I'm not a fan of putting the clips in uh, if I don't. Some people are. Um, I'm not. Uh, uh, think about how to, I can portray tactical vote at election time in a short. I already have. There's certain, there's some, I have, so every week, sorry, we're running out of time now, but every week I do, uh, I mean, I have my list of things to do in my scripts that I write and stuff like that. And on a sun the Sunday is my start of the week. I, um, and then, you know, I transfer anything that was unused to the next weeks and start that again. But I also have a separate one of things that I want to cover when the election is actually called. So I, I am already trying to work on that as well. Uh, we'll say, I think the artwork makes the videos less appealing. Uh, low effort like clickbait misinformation it's not my channel obviously you do you well that is see if that were true that would be a reason not to do it that's a much more serious objection to these things that don't actually make sense however there are times in the past when i've done things whenever you make any change on a channel there will be people who don't like it inevitably because you're doing it to try and appeal to others it's a little bit like the issue of, of Labour trying to attract enough votes to win an election, isn't it? One, for example, the biggest, and I have had, you know, objections. The biggest one I've had in the past was, um, so I used to do a video at 6 a.m. in the morning. Then there'd be like another one at, I think it was 12 noon and then 3 p.m. when I did three a day. And I realized that this was really bad. There's not many people on YouTube at 6 a.m., right? So I changed the schedule to, uh, it's also when I was changing it to two videos a day anyway. So I changed it to 12 noon, so I kept that one and then had my second one at 5 p.m. So I lost the 6 a.m. one. And I had a lot of comments, more comments than complaining about AI art. A lot of comments saying, please don't do this. 
and it was like but it meant I got a load of extra views I got loads more views doing a video at 5 p.m. than I did at 6 a.m. Um, and you know it's not just that it works itself out over the next 24 hours like you need those views in the first hour the video goes out because because YouTube, the algorithm, right, Mr. Algorithm, is looking at it. And if they go, oh, there's loads of people watching this, I'll recommend it to loads of other people in the second hour. And if it's like, oh, there's not many people watching this, they don't recommend it to as many. So you do have to look at these things. So at the end of the day, I'm going to do it until I've got enough data to see, has it made a difference, yes or no? Um, if it's made a difference, is it a positive difference or a negative difference? If it's a negative difference, you can bet your ass it's out, it's in the bin immediately. If it's a, if it's not made any difference, I won't go back to the old thumbnails though. I will have to think of something else, because the, the the thumbnails as they were, I don't mind for this live stream because this is like not heavily targeting lots of other people, but I for the normal videos, um, the thumbnails as they were are a weakness. I'm not, you know, there's some weaknesses you sort of, and it takes too much effort to do something about. But a thumbnail, you know, if I was to give any aspiring YouTuber a single piece of advice, it is that you cannot overstate the importance of the thumbnail because without that, no one clicks on it at all. Uh, but there it is anyway. We have completely run out. Do I record videos on the day? Um, generally, yes. I, I, Try to write, the certain scripts I can write days in advance, sometimes weeks in advance, but I try to record them on the day in case something happens. Because I have in the past sometimes recorded a video, intended it to come out that day, then something happens, so I have to do another one, and then it's five days later and I've got to re-record it because I'm talking about something that happened yesterday and all of a sudden it happened five days ago. Um, but there we go. Um, but I'll have to leave it there, so we've completely run out of time. Uh, I will do that video again. People can put comments as well. I do read the comments. I reply to some. If I don't reply to them, it's probably because someone else has made the point. I probably reply to them or something. Um, but I, you know, I will uh, try and get those done. And I might do a video on it as well. But there we go. Thanks for coming on, everyone. Have a very good evening. And until next time, I'll see you later.